right, good evening everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Hudson Library and Historical Society. We are very happy to see everyone here this evening and excited for tonight's presentation. Tonight's program, I would just like to let you know, is just one of many author programs we have scheduled here at the library um, from now until May. I believe we have over about almost 30 authors scheduled to make appearances in that time. Um, if you aren't sure of our schedule, we have plenty of brochures in the back um, on the table that has information about our upcoming authors, music programs, and everything else. I'm not going to sell many of those author programs tonight, but one that I think many of you would be really interested in and knowing about would be Aaron P. Dworkin, who will be here on Thursday, May 7th at 7 p.m. to discuss his book, The Entrepreneurial Artist, Lessons from Highly Successful Creatives. In his book, he interviews 12 prolific creative individuals to provide a game plan for anyone who wants to create a successful artistic endeavor. So I know a lot of you are podcasters or entrepreneurs at heart, and I think you'd be very interested in that event. We're also very excited for tonight's speaker because many of you know in January of this year, the library launched our new creativity lab, which supports state-of-the-art multimedia creation and filming, podcasting, and much more. Crafting your skill is an art, and whether you're here tonight because you wish to create your own podcast or just a fan of podcasts, I'm sure tonight's presentation will be very rewarding. I know that some of the people in attendance tonight have already toured and used our lab. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit our website or even talk to me after the program. Now, let's move on. It is my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker, veteran NPR podcast creator and strategist, Eric Newsom, who will be discussing his latest book, Make Noise, a creator's guide to podcasting and great audio storytelling. Newsom is the former director of programming and acquisitions and vice president of programming for NPR, where he worked to build NPR's popularity as one of their top podcast producers in the country. He also has local ties to WKSU here in Ohio um, as the operations director. Today, he is the co-founder of Magnificent Noise, a premium podcast production and creative consulting company in New York City. We invite everyone to stay at the conclusion of this program. We do have copies of his book available for purchase, courtesy of the Learned Owl at the back of the room. And Mr. Newsom will be staying for signing and discussion after for a short reception. So if everyone could please join me by giving a warm welcome to Mr. Eric Newsom. Hi, my name's Eric. I'm gonna talk a lot about podcasting. It always helps me to know who I'm talking to. So how many people here listen to podcasts? Most everybody, it'd be kind of weird if you didn't. Um, half of the U.S. population has listened, and about a quarter listen to podcasting every week. Anybody want to guess at the average number of podcasts a list, the average listener subscribes to? Seven. Seven. So that's more than I listen to. So, um, uh, and how many of you are making a podcast now? Surprising number. How many of you are thinking about making? A surprising number as well. Great, good. So um, I'm going to sit here and ramble for a little while, and then we'll ask questions and answers, which is usually when the best part is most fun for me, hopefully for you too. And uh, I'll tell you a bunch of stuff about podcasting and how they're made and what the common elements are of podcasts that work and how we define work. And uh, then uh, well, I have a couple clips I want to play. Uh, there was a visual presentation which its only real function is to keep me on track as to what I'm supposed to be talking about. I see a, a slide, and oh, I'm uh, supposed to talk about that. We can't get it to work, but we can't get the audio to play. So when it's time for audio, I'll step back and listen to, uh, or we'll listen to things together. So there's four numbers you need to know in order to understand podcasting in the world today. 609, 100, 59 point, or 50, yeah, 59.9, and 5,000. 609, 609, excuse me, dyslexic, 906, 906,000 podcasts is the number of podcasts that are available today. 100 is the number of languages where you find podcasts in 100 different languages, and there are 59.9 million episodes of content available. 5,000 is the number of new podcasts per week in 2019. That means that by the time I'm done talking, there will be seven podcasts that didn't exist when I started talking. 
So as a listener, you can take that one of two ways. You can take it as that's overwhelming and I don't know what to do and I can't find things I'm looking for. When the web had that problem, some guys created something called Google, you may have heard of, that kind of solved that problem. We don't have that in podcasting yet. Eventually, someone's going to figure that out. If you're a creator, you can look at that and say, how do I stand out in a field of 906,000 other things? And it's actually quite easy. And uh, some people look at this number and they think that's an overwhelming, it's too many, there's too much happening. That's roughly the number of websites that existed in the United States in 1997. And in the past 23 years, the internet has figured out new things to do. So I think that there's a lot more podcasting to come. And of those 906,000 podcasts that are available, a lot of people ask, uh, how, how do I make something work? And there's actually something that all the successful podcasts have in common. And before I tell you that, uh, I want to define what I mean by success. And this is where a lot of people get tripped up in podcasting. They're, I don't know how to be successful, I don't know what success is, and I look at you know, TED Radio Hour that has 15 million downloads a month, and I look at Radio Lab, which has a very similar number. Joe Rogan, or the Daily from the New York Times has downloaded two million times a day, right? How do I, and I do my podcast, does that mean I have to do that in order to be successful? Absolutely not. I think that one of the most important things to do, uh, if you're a storyteller of any stripe, is to have a sense of intention. And in podcasting, it's really important. For people like me who used to work in radio, um, radio stations have 20, 30 different competitors in a market, right? Now in podcasting, you switch to 906,000. There's a economic principle, I can't remember the name of it, that the larger the city, the more specific the stores have to be. In a tiny town of a thousand people, you can have a general store that sells everything, but in a metropolis, you have to have stores that function uh, selling very, very specific things, and podcasting is the same thing. A sense of intention is really understanding what makes you different than anything else. And it's a lot easier than you think. When I ask people what their podcast is about, they say, oh, it's me and my friend, and we have conversations about film, right? I say, good luck, there are 10,000 of those at least, if not 40,000 or 50,000, whatever, right? So look at the components of that sentence and examine each one of them. My friend and I having conversations about film. So it just so happened this was a, a young producer, a woman, and her friend was also a woman. They worked in media and aspired to work in film. And the more I talked to them, the more I realized that what they wanted to do is they wanted to talk about to women filmmakers from a previous generation to understand what advice they would have to new filmmakers. And if you look at that equation, which took like five minutes to pull out of her, that's a specific idea. There's not 10,000 of those. There's not 50,000 of those. There may be a couple others, but there's all sorts of ways in which intention defines something and makes it unique. And when you are trying, when you're creating something that is two young uh, aspiring filmmakers talking to people about film, women about film, in order to guide them in their career, mentor them in their career, 15 million people aren't going to listen to that, and that's okay. You define success by am I defining who I want to reach, and am I actually being able to connect with those people? If you are a beekeeper and you want to make a podcast about beekeeping, you know, there's a couple people in Northeast Ohio I'm sure would find that really interesting. In the world, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands. And that is equally as successful as the Daily's two million downloads a day. So what I always tell people when they start off and they talk about, oh, I want to make a podcast about X, like back up, you're way too far down. You start off with a sense of intention of who am I talking to? Whenever I sit down with anyone, the first thing I ask them is tell me who your audience is. They say, well, it's for everyone. And I'm saying, no, 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 you mean it's for no one. Because they don't hear themselves in it. They don't hear themselves reflected in it. And what I make people do, and I make people from big media companies and someone I'm getting together with over coffee, is I make them go and I make them find a picture of a human being in the world, go to Google Images, and just find a picture and, and, and write a fake bio for that person. And tell me who that person is. And then tell me what their problems are and how your podcast is going to solve those problems. It's a sense of intention. And I, then the next thing I advise people to do is to
to think of what your message is. If you're doing a podcast about the future and you think the future is horrifying and scary, is gonna be filled with robot overlords and we can't breathe, we all live underground, that's a very different podcast than when if you think that the future is bright and full of potential and possibility and you can't wait for tomorrow, right? Two very different messages that make two very different podcasts, right? And then, uh, you know, in media for years, reporters, producers, creators, journalists have been drilled to remove themselves. Like, you should be uh, objective in, 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 and remove your own biases and view from the story. When I started working at NPR in 2004, there was still a, a rule at NPR that you could not write yourself into the story regardless of what happened. And the example we used when we were debating whether this rule should continue or not was you are in a square in some foreign city and a bomb goes off in the square. And the prevailing thought at that time was you would write that a bomb went off in the square. You would not write, I was in the square when the bomb went off. And you definitely wouldn't write, I felt scared or confused or frightened when the bomb went off in the square. And luckily that rule doesn't exist at NPR anymore. But I think that within the age of podcasting, we have gone completely in the 180 degree direction where not only are you supposed to be part of the story, you, it is a, an important element of authenticity for you to declare what, who you are and how you fit into this story or this conversation. And I should say that out of 906,000 podcasts, there are really only two different kinds of podcasts. There are podcasts where people are chatting and there are people telling stories. That's it. Everyone falls into one of those two categories. And most times when people are chatting, they're actually telling stories. So maybe it's just one type. But that's why when I talk about storytelling and podcasting, I'm really talking about almost anything, even an interview and a conversation, a roundtable conversation, you're telling stories. Right? So um, I'm the kind of person who likes to kind of sit there and think about things probably a little too much. And I have repeatedly over the years tried to figure out like what is the recipe that makes something work in podcasting. And the closest I've ever it will come is there's three elements that every successful podcast has all three and a, and a unique combination of them. Story, character, and voice. I'll explain what each one of those means. Okay. So story is almost like a sense of intention for the story you're telling. It is, this podcast is about something, it's about something very specific. So for example, my friend Heather has a podcast. It's called Whiskey Cats. They talk about two things on Whiskey Cats. Would you like to guess what those two things are? <laughs> they talk about whiskey, and they talk about cats. And the way it works, for they've done three seasons of this, and every time they get a bottle of whiskey, and the three of them, the, lately one of them moves, so one of them joins via Skype now, this big technology, um, they drink the bottle of whiskey while they are recording the entire thing, and they talk about their cats. That's it, right? It is, it's got an audience, it's been probably measured in dozens or hundreds, but it was an, a way for them to connect to the world, right? And to connect to each other and have fun and to share that fun with others. And in the second season, they branched out into whiskey cocktails. They thought that was kind of like, you know, but it had to be whiskey based. And then they started to get a lot of people, including myself, I have to admit, saying, you should broaden out what you're talking about. Um, I'm gonna talk about wine or movies or all this stuff. And they're like, no, 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 whiskey. That's it. And it wasn't until later that I realized the brilliance of what they were doing, right? It, it was definable, it was about them, it gave them enough of something to talk about that it kind of held everything together. There's a, a podcast I love called uh, Denzel Washington is the Greatest Actor of All Time. And it's two guys, and guess what they talk about? Every, every time they talk about Denzel Washington movies for a little bit, and then they kind of go off into some other tangent and then come back to it at the end, and next week it's another Denzel Washington movie. Thank goodness he keeps making more movies, they have more things to talk about. But it becomes the kind of defining principle of them. Every good story is about something. It's about something specific. And I think that uh, uh, when you're doing a conversation, that like Whiskey Cats is obviously a conversation, it does, you do not need to be as, as obvious about it as Whiskey Cats 
or um, uh, Denzel Washington, who's the greatest actor of all time. But having a sense of intention as a storyteller, I always talk about storytelling is, whether you're in a conversation or, or you are in a narrative series, is uh, like imagine a dark forest, right? And in a dark forest, the pe reason people are scared of the dark is not because they scare the dark, they scare what could potentially be in the dark, and they don't know, right? They're, they have no way to navigate it. And you as a storyteller are the person with the flashlight. And flashlights do two different things. They illuminate what you want people to see, and it has the ability to hide everything else. Because the things that aren't illuminated by the flashlight are harder to see, and as a storyteller, if you're telling a story, there are thousands of facts and rabbit holes and theories and tangents and characters and scenes and different things happen. How do you figure out which ones are important and not? And if you set that intention in the beginning, it gives you some guidance as to where to shine your flashlight for the listener. So I'm gonna play an example about this. This is about three minutes long. This is from a series I did with Ted called Sincerely X, which is basically anonymous TED Talks. I, I love the first three minutes of this, and I play it for people all the time. So we're going to play this, and I hope it actually works. Look. Can you tell me what you look like? <laughs> oh, man. So I am of average height for a man. I got lucky. Uh, I am white. I'm on the thinner side. So when you pass me on the street, the only thing you see is a skinny white dude. I mean, you, you wouldn't even notice me. Like, I am so unnoticeable. But what I think about when I walk by people on the street, even now, do they know? Can they clock me? Clocking is a term used in the transgender community that means identifying someone as trans. And it's a word today's guest thinks about a lot. My name is Sarah Kay, and this is Sincerely X from TED and Luminary Media. In each episode of the show, we hear a story from an anonymous person who helps us give light to ideas we might never hear otherwise. Today, our anonymous guest is a man from the American South. And if you met him, that's what your impression would be, too. So it, it begs the question, like, how many other men have I run into, passed by, whatever? And they were, but I didn't know. And that's one of the crazy things about being stealth. You get to live privately and anonymously. But it can be lonely. That's why I think the bathroom bills are so funny. They're not funny, but what's funny about it is, is that those people that present those bills assume that you can clock a trans person, and you can't. We can't clock each other sometimes. And that is the beauty of medical transition for some people, is they get to do that. For trans people who can move through the world without being seen as trans, the choice to be public or private about their gender history is complicated, more complicated than you might think. Our guest feels pressure to be, quote, out from all sides. Some people want him to be out because they think that is necessary to advance the rights of trans people, while others want him to be out because they feel entitled to know the history and the details of his body. <laughs> It's crazy, but it's true that there is a large part of the population that thinks that trans people living their private, authentic lives is deceitful or inauthentic to the public. Uh, I would argue that I don't know a whole lot about the vast majority of people I meet, and it's not my business. Um, I think cisgendered people thinking that it is their business to know about any trans person's body, their uh, history, um, their journey, their trials, their difficulties is incredibly invasive and out of line. 
most people would never expect that level of intimacy with someone they don't know. So think about the last 10 seconds of that clip and then think about the first 45 seconds of that clip. If we had, so this conversation is with someone who is a trans person and is completely stealth, their spouse knows, their in-laws don't even know. Like it is completely kept a secret and as is, uh, it's a very contentious position to take. If we had started that interview with his thesis statement, which is the last 10 or 15 seconds, people would have made an immediate judgment um, on that conversation. And when we recorded it, it was almost at the end that Sarah said, because so, Sarah was not in the same room with him, and said, what, what do you look like? And he, that, that's what you heard was almost the last thing we recorded in a two hour conversation. And so we have a flashlight and we have a two hours of conversation about a very, very politically, religiously contentious uh, subject. Like where do we start it? Like we start it with the thing that makes you want to know. Because when he says, can they, do they, can they tell? I see people all day and I wonder, can they tell? And you're, as a listener, I mean, so there was someone up here whose head popped up as soon as he said that. Like, you're in. You want to know. Whether you agree or not, whether you support the, you know, there are many people who support trans people and don't agree with the, the decision to remain stealth. Um, but you're in. You're listening. You're open. And we can take you to the place where we can have the difficult conversation, whereas if we immediately started there, it would be much more divisive. So it's not only having a series of intention about what we wanted to talk about it, but what is the most inclusive way to bring as many people into that conversation as possible. I happen to be a subscriber to the belief that almost any two people in the world stuck in an elevator for 45 minutes will emerge friends, and that most of the reason that we don't get along with people is because we don't even take the time to listen. My 10-year-old son the other day was trying to get some advice to me, like, um, how do you get girls to pay attention to you and interested in you? It's like, he's just throwing this out. He's 10 years old. And I said, what do you think it is? And his first answer is playing guitar. <laughs> I'm like, doesn't hurt, right? And his next idea was baking. I'm like, again, doesn't hurt. He's like, well, what is it then? I'm like, just listen, right? That's how you get to know someone. That's how you make someone interested in you, is just by listening. And he, of course, like, Pfft. Right, whatever, walked away. <laughs> so the, having that sense of story, like what, not only what is the story you tell, but if you think about who you're gonna be listening to that and how you can get them in the most receptive way possible, it provides you with a roadmap through a conversation. Right? So the second is character. How do you, what is character? Now you think of character in a fictional story. You think of character, I'm gonna take my time, I'm doing great. Uh, you think of character in like the fictional sense, uh, there's characters in everything. We're always playing roles all the time. And even in a conversation or an interview, there's a role of an interviewer and there's a role of the interviewee. And everyone is kind of playing roles all the time. And so you as a creator get to define what those roles are. If, if whether it's understanding, I'm the interviewer and I'm coming to this conversation as a subject matter expert as well, and we're having a, a very high level conversation, or I'm coming to this as a proxy for the listener who knows very little about this, and I'm asking you questions, and the, really the spotlight is completely on you and your knowledge. To, taking the, a moment to define that, the first example I told you is a conversation, the second one is an interview, and it's a very important distinction. Right? Are you an equal to this person, or an adversary, is this a debate, or am I trying to get, am I trying to get information out of you? Um, so those are characters and should be defined, and I think that most people are like, oh, we're gonna have a conversation about film. Don't think about, like, who are we and what, what is our role in this? Uh, narrative, I always push characters as being a little different than people think, instead of even being as simple as, like, who people are, what their story is. The next layer down is who's a good guy and who's a bad guy, right? Uh, what are motivations for these characters? And I even go a step further often to think, what does this person play to get in that kind of walk through the forest with the flashlight. Where, how do they fit into this equation to get someone where you want? There's a series that I've worked on for a couple of years called Where Should We Begin with a relationship therapist named Esther Perel. You've heard this before. 
It basically, Esther Perel kind of has a crazy profession. If you don't know who she is, if people know who she is, a couple, yeah. So she's like the marriage therapist of last resort. Like, if you go to a marriage therapist and they say, I can't deal with you, we're sending you to Esther. Esther sees couples one time for three and a half hours and sends them back out the door and usually messes up their heads so much. They go back to the first therapist and they're like, we need to help understanding what just happened, right? <laughs> and and uh, when we, I saw her do a TED talk, she was brilliant. I kind of made a connection to her, and like, let's do something together, and we had no idea what to do. And kind of after a while, she got, we, she got really frustrated at some of the ideas we were coming up with and said, why don't you just tape me with a couple and see what happens? And we went into the room, and we're listening to these couples, and I think the one we taped, there, the first one we, I think the first one we taped there was, um, uh, they, she said, you guys can't communicate with each other, we're gonna have you role play, and the man decided he was gonna speak in French, even though his wife didn't speak French, and Esther had to translate. And, she, and everybody starts crying within five minutes. And then like an hour later, they're like singing together. It was just the most bizarre experience I'd ever listened to. And I'm like, this is the story. This is what we do. And so you're, you're, in the, you're in the, this is a difficult, you're listening to someone in the most intimate conversation they're ever going to have. Um, in a, one of the most high stakes conversations they're ever gonna have. And if you are you know, going down 77 and traffic is terrible and you're trying to figure out how you're gonna get where you need to go and you pop this in, you're in that world and I need to get you between two people on a couch about to have a difficult conversation. And so we always open every episode with excerpts from the screening call, we call it, where we first meet the couple and we talk to them for about an hour, kind of, we talk to them separately so they can tell us about their problems. And I'm gonna play you an example of one couple. It's about two minutes long, but see if it kind of gets you to the place where you wanna hear what happens next. Many people told me that I was the last person on earth they thought would ever do something like that. My dad was a serial cheater, and I promised myself I would never follow in his footsteps, but I did. You know, I fell in love with someone. That's what happened. I mean, I fell in love, and I was in a sexless, dead marriage, and I fell in love, and it was happier than it had been in my entire life, yet I'm being shunned. You know, I felt like the scarlet letter, I just had a big A on my chest, and everyone's like, he's a cheater, and he is toxic. I think an affair in a small town, if it gets out, <laughs> it gives people something to talk about. What this couple wrote to me in advance of the session was that they lived in a small town, that they both had been married, both had a child from their first marriage, that they had had an affair. And we kissed, and it was just like, that was it. And for the next nine months, we were like, just, <laughs> you know, having sex everywhere and outside and skinny dipping. And that summer was like, we felt like we were in high school. It was all kind of a blur, but there was so much passion and so much fire and so much hope and promise of what could come of this. <laughs> they then broke up. They then had different partners on whom they then cheated in an affair with each other again. And in effect, they had cheated on each other and with each other. Now that was a red flag, but I thought, I'm different. This is so different. I mean, he left his marriage for this. This is big. No one's ever called me out on, you know, my lies and deception. Like, I could do anything. And I did. <laughs> and despite the brute reality of all those lies, her dominant question was, can I trust this man? And do we have a chance to start all over. I love playing those Astair opens in a room full of people because at the beginning you're fidgeting and looking at your phone and whatever, and at the end everyone is sitting completely still. <laughs> you know, that, that thing at the end is the question of that episode, which you then follow through. Like, they had, they had this really hot affair, and can they actually be a couple? And, um, you will pr probably already, in two minutes and 19 seconds, have strong opinions about these two people and what they did. 
and they become characters for a conversation about your sense of right and wrong. We always talk about a, a stair show as being, it initially feels like a window into this intense conversation this couple's about to have, and when you get close to the window, you see it as a mirror, and that it actually reflects back on you. We figured this out very early on. After we did that couple, we cut it down. We did another couple, and we cut it down, and we started playing them for people. Like, do you think this is interesting? Is it gonna work? And every single person came back and said, I listened to that show, and then I had a conversation with my partner that night about what I had heard. Everybody said this. We're like, oh, that's cool. Let's make that happen. And so we did that, and you know, 27 million times later, a lot of people are having a lot of conversations. But using those two people in that situation to get you into the place where you're ready to listen to that, and you've had a chance to love them or hate them or respect them or, or, or be revolted by them, and I'm sure everyone in this room has an opinion on whether they should remain a couple, and you've only heard them for two minutes and 19 seconds. So the third element is voice, and this is the one that most people have the hardest trouble understanding, which is it's, that, it, it's the culmination of inserting yourself or inserting your perspective or your opinions into the production process of like there's only one version of this story because it's coming from me. Um, I am uh, starting on a new project with uh, Deepak Chopra um, that we're starting on next week. And I am looking at him through the eyes of his children, which is very interesting to have your father grow up and become this guru to the millions and then have to live with him every day. And it makes for a very interesting <laughs> situation um, and a very humanizing situation. And so they are basically the primary tellers of uh, what my guess is, we're just starting, or will be some of the primary voices in this um, as the hosts. You know, if you were doing this as a journalistic enterprise 20 years ago in a news station or an NPR or something like that, you would never allow his children to be part of that process. And now, actually, they become the lens in which you see something that's very difficult to learn otherwise. And also, you know, who you are, the opinions you have, the experience you have, and being true to yourself is, I think, a really important part in, in, in podcasting that many people uh, don't spend the time to think about what I really am. Like, I, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I live outside New York City, I, I have an electric car, I collect autographs, I do all these other things. Which version of me is sitting in front of that microphone? And which do I include and which do I just choose to not include? Um, and a lot of my r former radio colleagues and a lot of other radio people across the country are all trying to rush into podcasting right now to create podcasts. And a lot of them are failing. And the reason a lot of them are failing is because they're ignoring this point, is they've been so trained to talk to 10,000 people on the radio station, they can't figure out how to have an intimate one-on-one -on -one connection to that happens 10,000 times and the difference between that. So um, I'm going to let you ask some questions. You've been very nice to sit here, and I think I remembered every one of my things I was supposed to talk about. Yes. So if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Ask away, because tomorrow it's $250 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think about Is it a fad? No. No evidence of it being a fad. The difference is that in other previous kind of explosive industries, blogging, for example, everybody's blogging, no one's reading. Right? That was the problem. And in podcasting, people are listening. It's, it's, it's amazing because if you, the one thing that is kind of out of whack is if you look at the average like what people listen to in the course of a week, all the audio listening they do, they do about half of it to AM and FM radio, still today, 2019. You read the press, you would not think that was the case. Um, 
About 20% of it is what's called owned music, which is like CDs, those type of things that are yours. About another 20% are things that are streamed on average. The Sirius XM gets a little piece, whatever. Podcasting is 3%. So even with this explosive growth, we go from zero, where we're at today seems explosive. When you look at it relative to listening across the country, there's still lots of listening happening in the radio. So I think there's a lot more room to grow. And as it grows, you will have a choice. Of, you'll have more choice to do what you do, which is, I'm not in the mood for A, I want to listen to B. And there will be two choices for you. Or I miss A, I'm going to stop listening to B and go back to A. right? And the great thing about podcasting is you don't have to sit there and suffer through A in order to get to B. You can pick what you want. You know, the, one of the, This is getting really nerdy for, for audio people. If you looked at a chart of radio listening, radio listening peaks in the morning, kind of craters in the middle of the day, and depending on what your format is, it either pops up a little bit in afternoon drive or continues to fade out. If you look at audiobooks, podcasts, basically all, all kinds of spoken word entertainment that aren't on the radio, it's dead in the morning, starts to pick up in the middle of the day, and then skyrockets in the afternoon drive and in the evening. And the only reason, I, there's no reason I think this other than my own observation, is people are tired of listening to impeachment and people yelling at each other and hot takes and well, how bad this team sucks and all these other things, and they want that gone, but they don't stop being smart people interested in things, and so they gravitate to our other media because that satisfies their curiosity and their intellect without having to be so mired in the day. And so is it a fad? No. There's no real indication of that. Um, Will it continue to diversify? Yes. And will you be able to just pick your mood? Yeah. Other questions? Sir? When, when podcasting first started, there really was audio podcasts and video podcasts, and then YouTube happened which was not a factor when, when, when podcasting started. And so you see, actually, I think that what would have been video podcasting is now YouTubers, and that is such a robust and diverse uh, thing. My 10-year-old son watches YouTube. He doesn't, watch, he doesn't even watch Netflix anymore. He's like, so passe. He watches YouTube, right? And he's people he follows and subscribes to, different things for different interests he has. And there's an economic model that those people make a substantial amount of money, sometimes crazy amounts of money, that people are able to support it off small individual donations. It's kind of like borrowing a lot of the public radio model of if you value this, help support it, and people do. And people are able to earn their livelihood. There's a guy I know who used to be a podcaster. He was a podcaster and a journalism professor. He started a YouTube channel where he was basically sharing recipes of how he fed his family in the evening uh, based off of his schedule and his wife's schedule, and they had young kids. He'd show basically recipes and how he did things that were fun and nutritious and introduced our kids to diverse food. That started to take off, and so he quit the podcast. Then it took off, and he quit his professor job, and now he does nothing but this. And he's got his little YouTube channel, and it's great. He makes a living off of it, and he's having fun. And I think that's a model that I think thrives, and I don't think access is going to change that. I think it's just going to make it easier. Uh, Adam Ragusea is his name, um, and it's spelled it's pretty much how it sounds, and you can find him, and it's, it's a really fun little channel. He's upgraded his equipment substantially and his production values both over time, but I think that's a, a, the, kind of the video equivalent of podcasting. Yes? So I'm glad that you mentioned the search engine possibilities of podcasting. I'm a grad student in Miami, and realized It's overwhelming. Well, I, I was like, just having a hard time finding anything that I could do. So go to the person you like their taste and ask them if they listen to podcasts and what they listen to. That's the Google trans. That's the Google version of uh, where we're at right now. Uh, you know, uh, and, and as weird as it is, uh, someone asked me the other day, well, what if I'm interested in this obscure thing and I want to find a podcast for it? How do I? I'm like, it's really hard. You go to Google, you type 
best, and then whatever subject you are, podcast, and it comes up, and you will find it. And, and they didn't believe me, so we did it on the fly. It was Barbie collecting, and there was a slew of Barbie collecting podcasts, right? Like, and like I can't believe there's Bobby, Barbie collecting. I'm like, there is. There's many of them. And here's, a, here's how you find them, which is, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about solving problems for listeners um, and creators. Every good podcast solves a problem. It either entertains you or gives you information or these type of things. And uh, I got that from reading a technologist when I was in college. His name was Neil Postman. He's been dead for many years. He wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, which is kind of a, a foundational thought in, in new technology back in the 80s, actually. And he said there's a three-point test for every piece of new technology. What problem does it solve? Two, whose problem is it solving? And question three is, what new problem have I created by solving the old problem? Right? <laughs> and uh, when you look at discovery, which is discoverability is what you're talking about. So in the industry, we talk about discoverability. How do people find podcasts? Every solution that's coming up now, it's a pro trying to solve this problem, which is I want to discover podcasts. But it fails because of the second problem, which is the second question, which is whose problem is it solving? And all these people are making investments in startups and so on and so forth to solve problems for networks and distributors who are trying to get data from you and sell you ads or put, or, or put ads in front of you. And it doesn't solve problems for listeners. It just helps aggregate listeners together. Like, come to our app and listen. That doesn't solve my problem, right? With this vague promise that I'm going to start recommending things to you. And the person who wins is all in technology is the person who solves listeners' problems or customers. And so someone is going to figure that out. Maybe I should stop solving a problem for this evil overlord, and I'm going to go solve a problem for the people who actually listen. And that will be the person who wins and comes up with a solution that will solve all your problems. Do I, how do I do it, or how, do you, how would you do it? So that's getting easier and easier. So uh, for those of you who couldn't hear his questions, how do you distribute podcasts? It's, it's very similar to the way that you distribute web pages um, in that you have to have a server somewhere where files live, your MP3 files of your podcast. And it has to be somewhere that a database can, can find and go grab and be able to access. So there are a number of services that range from free up to like $15, $20 a month that will serve your podcast for you. And the, the uh, it, it, you get what you pay for in that scenario. If you're getting it for free, your podcast may not update for a day or two after you p upload it. It may be really slow to kind of get out into the world. The $20 one, it's almost instant and in between, like all customer service, those type of things. There are even apps now, there's one called Anchor that Spotify bought a couple months ago, which if you download that on your phone or your iPad, you have everything you need to distribute a podcast. You know, you and I could go in, in the other room with Anchor, and we could have a podcast in 15 minutes. It will even do your, your artwork for you, for your tile. It will help you do that. And it has like stock art and text and designs you can use. And it will do everything for you. You don't have to do a single thing. You don't even have to know how to make an MP3 or anything. You literally record it in the app, you edit it in the app, and you can post it in the app. And if you haven't done it before, it'll set everything up for you so it shows up where it needs to show up. Oh, so when you create a podcast, you can pick where you want it to be. Apple Podcasts and Spotify combined take up about 80% of the podcast listening. And then there's a ton of others. And usually those others pick up their database entries from scraping them out of Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And then they pick them up. So if you end up in those two, you'll pretty much end up anywhere. Podcast app? Yeah. I think all podcast apps suck. They're terrible. And the problem is they're trying to be everything to everyone, which means they're nothing to no one. And like you might listen to 10 podcasts and listen to a podcast of some kind every day. And I may be tired of podcasts when I go home and I want to talk about them. I don't want to listen to them. And I might listen to something once a week, right? Yet we're forced to use the same apps, right? Someone might be 
you know, like to exercise and listen to podcasts while they're exercising and can't sit there, or in a car and want to sit there and play with buttons while they're driving or up on a treadmill or whatever, they're a different user experience. So there's like, the reason these apps are all terrible is everyone is doing basically the same thing, which is trying to be everything to everyone. And you won't see podcast apps really break out until they solve the problem of I'm trying to be the podcast listening app for runners or for people in their cars or for people who only like true crime. And that will solve some of that discoverability problem, too. So, other questions? Sir? Uh, yeah, sort of a uh, planning or deadline question, I guess. Um, giving your network all your stuff as an example, where is the line between sort of planning and outlining episodes or even uh, multiple episodes versus letting the interview take you where it goes? Um, I guess the question is sort of how much do you get out in front of yourself and outline? So uh, this is something that's not in the book. I just kind of stumbled upon this recently because I get asked this question so much, which is basically how much preparation should you put in? And the companion question is how much editing should I do afterwards? And I always say that if you're, doing a, you're recording a conversation or you're having an interview, that draw a line. And then think about how much time you have to work on this. It could be I've got to get this done today, so I've got three hours. Or it could be I have four days, whatever. And just that line is the middle of the process when you record that interview. And you should spend time preparing and then time editing afterwards, accordingly, right? Um, if you have a lot of time for something, like, a, like, a, like days, if that's the case, maybe shift a little bit more towards the post side. But I always tell people, walk in with a plan, walk in with an outline of what you think that interview should be, have it divided into chapters based on the subject matter, come in with an interview questions, and then be prepared to throw the whole thing out, right? The best interviewers I know spend so much time on preparation, then they walk in the studio and they barely look at their questions because it's so in their head. You know, I've seen that happen time and time and time again. And then you have it as a reference point to go back to afterwards. When you're talking to someone like, did I talk about everything I wanted to? Yes, but I also follow my curiosity. Because if you just go in and wing it, it's gonna be crap. And if you go in with questions, and you're not listening, you know, interviewing is really about listening, then you're gonna miss things. Like, I, like, I've never heard this specific example, but like, when did you start racing cars? Well, when I was 19 years old, I killed my first girlfriend, and then I discovered that I loved cars, and so I got in a car and I became a car runner. And then they go on to the next question afterwards. I'm like, wait a minute, what is this? But if you're not listening, like, uh, Errol Morris, the documentarian, says that he used to record interviews on 60 minute cassettes, so it was 30 minutes on each side, and his goal was to never ask more than one question per side. And just shut up and let people talk. Like, tell me the story of this, and then just sit there and be quiet. It's the greatest interviewer trick. I'm saying this in front of, there's some people here who are journalists I know for a long time. The best trick in, in, when you're in an interview is just shut up. Because when they give you the answer, they're giving you the answer they were prepared to give you. And then if you're just sitting there, they rush into that space. Remember, everybody's filling roles, and they know they are the interviewee, and they're supposed to be talking. So if they're silenced, they're not doing their role. And so they'll spit something else out. And that second answer is the good answer, because it was, was what they were prepared to say. And they're thinking, this person isn't buying what I'm saying, so I'm going to sit here and <laughs> say something I wasn't prepared to and probably shouldn't. Bang, got him. Right. So other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I really enjoyed Blackboard. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, so he's talking about West Cork, which is a, a, a show we did at Audible. It's still available in, inside of Audible. It looks at a 22-year-old um, crime now uh, in a rural town in Ireland that was never solved. And we did it a couple years after Serial had come out. And um, there was this glut. It seemed like every day someone was putting out a new like unsolved crime. I, I, and I remember saying at the time, eventually we're gonna run out of unsolved crime, so this is gonna end at some point. And I, or unless people start killing each other at a higher rate, then we have to do podcasts about those. It's so, it was so popular at the time that there were conventions of people who would get together who were all doing unsolved crime podcasts, right? And so 
Um, and uh, there was one guy, I actually thought about going to one of these conventions, just to be a fly on the wall, and there was one guy who was speaking at one of these conventions who was accusing the father of a murdered person um, that, of being the criminal, and his evidence was basically that the guy wouldn't talk to him for his podcast, <laughs> right? And like, this is not, so things are getting out of control. People are doing crazy stuff, and we're sitting around brainstorming, what do we want to do? And I said, let's do a true crime podcast. And like, why would you want to do that? I'm like, because everyone's doing it. And there's a way to do it in a way that no one, will, no one else is doing it. And if we can't find that story or the approach that makes it different than every other True Crime podcast, then we won't do it. And so we set the high, I have this unfortunate knack of picking the most difficult thing and trying to do it the most difficult way because it's a challenge. And that was what we did with that. And so basically, if you listen to, West Cork, I'm not uh, uh, stealing it for you who haven't heard it. Um, it. You start off talking about this unsolved crime, and four episodes in, you're not talking about the crime anymore. You're talking about the town where it happened. And uh, there's a thing in the book about how I tell people to come up with 10 word phrases for to describe your podcast. It's kind of like an editorial North Star. And for West Cork, it was unsolved mystery rever reveals underbelly of rural Irish town. And so when we were going through all the facts of that case, and all the 150 interviews we did for it, it took almost a year and a half to do it. Um, every scene, including the opening scene of it, is all about does it make the town more interesting? So you let, care less about the crime and you hear more about where it worked. So if you haven't heard it, it's great. We're, it's, um, there's a rumor it may come out as a regular podcast um, later this year. We're not, still not quite sure if that's going to happen. Oh, yeah, just going back to other books. Uh, yes, um, uh, people still call me up and ask me. I did a book about vampires that came out uh, uh, 10 years ago, or actually longer than that. It came out like 12 or 13 years ago. And um, uh, people still call me and ask me about it, and I don't think they understand the premise of that book, which is that I knew nothing about vampires, cared very little about vampires, <laughs> but decided to spend two years of my life writing a book about vampires, uh, and what I learned in the process, and the people that I met, and so on and so forth. And, and so they expect that I've watched all these movies and care about this stuff, and, and I don't. <laughs> right. um, I will say, though, that uh, I, I, I still am a glutton for punishment, and I watched uh, the guy who did Sherlock for the BBC recently on Netflix now. There's a ver he did a take on Dracula, which is three, like, hour and a half episodes. It's amazing. I, it is the best Dracula I've ever seen, and I've seen a lot of Dracula's. I think I watched, like, 300 movies. Book. So, so it's on Netflix. It's called Dracula, and it's by the same guy who did Sherlock for the BBC a couple years ago. And it's just brilliant. So, anything else? Yes. Um, One or two more? 906,000. Yes. It's a very good question. A lot of people try to make money in podcasting, um, not many succeed. So, I always say that. that um, if you wanted to replace one full-time salary and expenses, so one person's livelihood and expenses for producing a podcast, you have to get about 50,000 downloads per episode in order to make that economically viable. And anyone here who's done a podcast, how many of you have 50,000 downloads per episode? Probably not many. Um, less than one half of 1% meet that threshold of all these 906,000 podcasts. So less than one half of 1% of them are able to get that one person's full-time salary. On the other end of that, one half of 1% is like a radio lab which has a staff of 20 and a multi-million dollar budget every year. And This American Life, which has 24 producers and uh, a budget of multiple millions of dollars. So it's, it's uh, uh, it, I always say, um, when people talk, uh, can I make a million dollars from a podcast? I'm like, sure, but you won't start off making a million dollars. If you look at people who do make money in podcasting, there was an article that came out last week that said Joe Rogan, who hosts the Joe Rogan Experience, made $30 million last year off his podcast um, with a staff of like three or four people. Um, he didn't start off making that money. He started off because it was fun. And he built it into something and realized that it was something that he could nurture and grow, regardless of what you think of him and his perspective on the world. He's very successful at this. And Mark Marin. 
you know, even Janet Boomrod who does Radio Lab, other people, they all started off because it was a fun thing to do and figured out how to build a community around it. And that's really the, the key, is it's building a community around it. So, last question goes to Macro. Well, it happens both ways. Um, I, my current advice to people who are podcasting is uh, if you are looking to be picked up by a network, uh, avoid doing that. It's actually a terrible position for you to be in. Um, networks don't make you money, they make you more money. Uh, they don't make you famous, they make you more famous. And people who even have a great podcast idea who go to a network and say, will you give me money to make this podcast, the deal you're gonna be signing for that is so horrible and so disadvantaged to you long term. You're gonna, first off, you're gonna give away all your rights to your content. You're gonna get maybe 20 cents on the dollar and they'll keep the other 80 if that. Sometimes it's 15 cents on the dollar. Um, and they'll own it, which means they can sell the movie rights, they can have someone, they can fire you and have somebody else host your podcast. Like they own it, it's theirs. Um, and if you live without the network and you grow on your own, you'll probably grow faster, grow stronger, um, and be better at making money than the network would be for you. Um, and then when it gets too big for you to manage, then you talk to a network and you're in a much better leveraging position than you would be if you're an independent with a, with a great idea. Okay, is that it? Anybody have a burning question? That's it, going once, going twice. Thank you, you've been very kind to come out here on a snowy night. We'll see you. All right.